so what I'm going to do is pre um, present you some background information. I think uh, much already did that very well. So I'm going to repeat a few things which I think are helpful to understand why we are motivated to do that global ayahuasca project. And I will also um, present some preliminary results. It's not uh, the final data, but so you can get an idea. Um, I think it's already nice what we have. So this is a slide which I can skip because you all know that and those who did not know uh, heard it from much. Um, in 2000, oh yeah, that's great, thank you. Maybe you can see it better now. Okay. In 2016, um, at the Second World Ayahuasca Conference, Daniel Perkins presented his ideas um, to do that Global Ayahuasca Project, and he already introduced some um, versions, first versions, how he wanted to do that, and we decided to collaborate and extend that to German-speaking uh, parts of the world. And the collaborations are with Australia, Brazil, Spain, Czech Republic, and Switzerland. And it's, we are a multidisciplinary research uh, team with people from public health, uh, psychology, psychiatry, anthropology. Um, and we are supported by a couple of uh, organizations like the MAPS, ICS PRISM, and the Mind Foundation. They are basically helping us with the promotion and yeah, support us. So you already talked about the globalization. So we know that ayahuasca comes from the Amazon region and it's been uh, used by indigenous cultures for ritual contexts. But then in 1930, also Brazilian churches adapted that and they included uh, Christianity and the ayahuasca practice. And nowadays we have a lot of neo-shamanic um, ayahuasca ceremonies all over the world. Most of the, uh, not all over the world, but around the globe, and it's increasing. And also another thing is that many people now not only uh, experience neo-shamanic ayahuasca ceremonies where they live, but they also travel to South America to experience how it's done there. Um, there's also recognition of ayahuasca in popular cultures with celebrities talking about their experiences and the media reports about ayahuasca in more positive but also negative ways, talking about healing effects, but also um, critical issues like um, abuse. So with this globalization comes a variation in risks because um, originally there was a carefully structured setting with the shaman providing the, um, the space and the care and also the ayahuasca churches, they provide a very well-structured setting. And now with the globalization and the variety of contexts and settings, this safety is not necessarily given. So the variety of safety uh, increases with the variety of settings. And this is a risk on an individual level, but we also have uh, risks on political or collective levels. Um, we know that ayahuasca has been prohibited in many countries, um, so there's the risk of criminalization. And I mentioned here as a last point, but I don't think that it's the least important point, the endangering of indigenous traditions. Talking about safety, um, long-term studies with ayahuasca showed uh, that in a church setting, there are minimal risks um, and there's no potential for dependency identified. But these church settings are, as we saw, very structured, very carefully, um, there's a, a container. Um, some safety issues regarding, um, can be found regarding like the, the support, the physical, emotional um, support and also after the ceremony in terms of integration, so people go to ceremonies and they come back and they don't, often don't have to, uh, enough support for psycho-spiritual integration. Another safety issue which has already been mentioned by much uh, that sometimes there are other plants involved and this can be fine but sometimes it's also dangerous. Um, Regarding the safety process, sometimes uh, there's a lack of screening regarding physical or mental uh, health or food and drug interactions, SSRI have been mentioned. Um, 
and an ayahuasca experience can have uh, effects on the pre-existing physical and mental health conditions. So, and another thing I think is very in important is uh, respecting the tradition, not only in that sense that we should respect the traditions of the indigenous, but that we should also be aware of our culture where we're coming from. So, even though we think um, this biomedical system is not really true, we grew up here and we have that culturally embodied, so it's also necessary to keep that in mind. And so, sometimes when uh, people go to uh, South America, which is already a very different culture, they sometimes lack the, uh, the guidance or the help to integrate it on a spiritual but also psychological level talking about uh, containers and cultural context. So it's uh, respecting traditions where ayahuasca is coming from, but also respecting our backgrounds, which um, influences us no matter if we want or not. Um, interesting about ayahuasca is that the motivation, unlike with other psychedelic substances, are uh, typically related to uh, healing. So people take ayahuasca for physical or emotional healing, uh, for personal uh, individual and collective development, self-awareness, spirituality or religion. Um, that's maybe also where the therapeutic effects or potential come from. So there's a lot of research going on showing that uh, ayahuasca is uh, beneficial for treating alcohol or other drug dependencies, mood disorders like depression, anxiety, PTSD, or also physical um, conditions like cancer and Parkinson. Um, interesting about that is that it doesn't seem to be diagnosis specific, but the underlying mechanism, there's this uh, discussion going on, not only, um, not only in the psychedelic research, but also in psychology in general, um, looking at the underlying mechanisms. <clears throat> yeah, and in Brazil and also some other countries, uh, ayahuasca, and um, and conventional medication are sometimes combined. We don't have too much data about that in Western contexts. And talking about those mechanisms underlying which might be beneficial for treating those disorders, um, um, there are studies showing, we're talking about increased confidence, uh, assertiveness, optimism, being more calm, peaceful, also cognitive or creative skills are mentioned. Um, also changes in belief systems or clarity about the life purpose. I think uh, you all know that. So there's a discussion going on on how do those uh, substances um, have that effect that is beneficial for mood disorders and others, which is not purely uh, pharmacological, obviously. Um, Along with that globalization, we are confronted with uh, policy challenges uh, regarding, for example, the legal status. I talked about that already. So um, cultures, indigenous cultures are confronted with uh, their medicine being illegalized all over the world. And this is also a problem at the place where they live. And at the same time, there's also an increasing recognition of cultural value of the knowledge of the indigenous people and also regarding human rights. Uh, that's where, how the UDV and uh, Santa Daime can uh, do their ceremonies all over the world, not all over the world, but in some places not other than Brazil uh, in a legal context. Um, there are public health co concerns uh, as a policy challenge because still psychiatry in Western countries is based on a biomedical paradigm. And as we saw, this doesn't seem to work too well if we talk about ayahuasca, um, because the mechanism can't like, be explained purely in a biomedical system. And this discussion is already going on in psychology in general, uh, but it's also very relevant for this. Um, psychedelic science. Uh, including spirituality in therapy is not so nice for many people in the Western world, so this is also a challenge. And the report of benefits are sometimes not so easily explainable in the paradigm we're 
usually working in the Western world in psychiatry. And there's more, when we, we talk about ayahuasca, it's more about mental health maybe, um, and the transformation and not so much about the substitution and the putting away the negative sides. Uh, so there's um, a lot of disinformation and challenges regarding the paradigms um, and a tra uh, like a conventional therapy would try to avoid uh, suffering uh, whereas in the ayahuasca ceremony you would maybe rather try to challenge yourself or confront yourself. So there's a lot of uh, lack of data outside of control context and a lot of disinformation. Um, which is our motivation to do that global ayahuasca pro project to inform drug and health policy and trying to contribute to that understanding how this medicine works, uh, understanding um, also the motivation and providing uh, the health policy with data, why people drink ayahuasca, why they do that and how they do that, in which contexts. Um, and we have like three phases. The first phase is now done, the global survey of ayahuasca drinking. It was from mid-2017 and we stopped the data collection in early 2019, like this year, and we have more than 7,000 completed um, reports. And that's how we promoted it. So if people drank ayahuasca, we, we invited them to fill out that online survey and if it was not ayahuasca, but uh, pharma wasca, for example, they were also welcome to uh, join the, the survey. It's a non-random cross-sectional survey. Uh, we investigated patterns of use, uh, reported effects of, on health and well-being, but we were also particularly interested in uh, like risks and harms. We have demographic data and the things that I mentioned before, like why and how they uh, people drink ayahuasca. The measures included are a variety of questionnaires and some single items uh, investigating well-being effects like uh, effects on life domain, like intimate relationships, uh, relationships with friends and fa family, physical health, emotional health, uh, sense of purpose, and life in general overall. We included uh, questionnaires uh, investigating like dimensions like self-acceptance, autonomy, purpose in life, relationships, uh, personal growth, things that you all know from ayahuasca experiences. We were also interested in the lifestyle, so how, if, and if the lifestyle would change, and if yes, how, like what about the diet, uh, exercise, time in nature, um, uh, comfortable or confidence, with sexuality, physical health and things. We asked if the, their life uh, changed and if yes, how. We asked about insights and spiritual significance. And we also included, as I said, adverse effects, like um, if they needed medical support, um, how they integrated the experience, if they had difficulties and how they felt or what changed after uh, the experience. Oh, I already said that, more than 7,000 respondents. Um, these data which I will present are preliminary and not based on the 7,000, but uh, like from two years ago, we already uh, had quite a lot of people that uh, responded, so the data are from there. Uh, we have people participating from, from 67 countries, uh, Brazil, USA, Switzerland, um, most of the drinking took place in Brazil, Peru, Netherlands, USA, Spain, Switzerland, Germany, Czech Republic, and Colombia, Australia. And I think it's quite nice that we have a high level of education, but this is also related to the paradigm and that it's still something out of society that people with a high level of education are more likely to have the opportunity. Um, so talking about the country of residence, you see that uh, Africa is black, so we don't have <laughs> that many people or no people from Africa responding to the Global Ayahuasca Survey, which I think is uh, interesting but also sad. So we don't know if it's just not as accessible there or if they did not know about the survey because of our uh, 
bad promotion or if there's no ayahuasca drinking. So the ayahuasca service may be biased a lot. Um, about the motivation, oh, it's very small. Can you read it? So I'm going to read it maybe. <laughs> so the, most of the people said that why they drank ayahuasca were, was for increased spiritual awareness and understanding for connection. Um, and then to gain insights into yourself or parts of your life, self-knowledge. To gain clarity about your life, purpose or direction. To deal with emotion difficulties. To improve personal relationships. To participate in a religious sacrament and so on. And only a few people mentioned that they just wanted to get high. I think um, if you read that, this is really not the biomedical paradigm. Um, then the motivation by region of consumption. I think interesting here is that we have in Brazil a little bit more of religious sacrament because that's where the, the churches come from, UDB and Santa Daime, Unial de Vegetal. And, uh, so it's uh, nat like natural that there are more people taking it because of religious reasons. Um, mostly mentioned spiritual awareness and connection. So, the pattern is pretty much the same everywhere, more or less. This is very interesting, I think, because I thought that in Brazil people would take it earlier because it's so much uh, in their culture. So the age of first use overall is a little bit more than 30. In Brazil, somewhere between 25 and 30. Um, in North America, they, there's the highest age of first use. I think that's interesting regarding demographics to get an, get an idea when people start with their ayahuasca practice. Um, most of the people have, when they filled out the questionnaire, had drunk ayahuasca two to five times, um, some more than a thousand times. Mm -hmm. So a variety of people we had filling out their questionnaire. Um, yeah, and some only took it once. Um, most of the people only drank with one group, um, some with two to five groups, and uh, it decreases. So most people have a group, and with that group they drink. 26% um, of the people have drunk ayahuasca in multiple countries. Uh, more than half of them drink regularly since the first time. Um, around half of them spend one night and then some spend two nights or even three and six over uh, six percent over ten nights uh, when they go to retreats that last a little longer. Um, what I was surprised about was the um, that some of them took alcohol like 3.8 percent which is not so <laughs> much. <laughs> That's because of the alcohol. <laughs> So that's not so much, but still, I was a little surprised by that. Uh, yeah, so uh, many combine it with cannabis. It's also a tradition uh, in Santa Daime, for example, to smoke the Santa Maria together with the Daime. Um, yeah, and around half of the people dr drank in two or more contexts. So maybe in a church, in a neo-shamanic, in a traditional shamanic, or in whatever. Um, most of the people drink it in natural contexts. Semi-urban is second, or urban environments with 17%. Um, this is also something that surprised me because people said that they knew the plants that were used. I'm not sure if really all of the people saying that they know which plants are contained in the ayahuasca they drink really know it, um, but people report they knew it. Uh, overall, more than 80%. In Brazil, they know the most. I would question that, but that's what they report. Um, the context of consumption mostly mentioned was the ayahuasca churches, then the traditional shaman guide with 18%, um, non-traditional with shaman or guide, um, then tradition or non-tradition shaman guide, uh, so that the traditional and non-traditional shaman or guide would do it together, and only 2.5% uh, without a guide, but with a ritual, without a guide, uh, with no ritual, only half percent, 
and some people take it alone with or without ritual, but only a few. Mostly it's ayahuasca churches. Um, I think that's nice to know that most of the people say that they felt a lot of support. So the blue um, line is the support provided, like opportunity to, to debrief the leader, um, availability of support during the ceremony, a sense of emotional and physical safety in the ceremony, empathy and respect. Um, only half of the people reported that they had the opportunity to, to discuss prior to the drinking, which I find is somehow critical, and uh, guidance prior about potential difficult experience. Only half of the people reported that. So I think it's nice that this blue line is very long, so a lot of support, but still we should also not forget the people that did not feel supported. Um, life effects, most of the people reported very beneficial effects, uh, extremely positive, 10, 0 would be extremely negative. So all over the world, um, people would report mainly positive effects on uh, life effects like uh, intimate relationships, other relationships, physical health, emotional well-being, life direction and life overall. Um, Yes, that's good to know, but still we have a variance, not to forget. Um, asking a little bit more in detail about changes in lifestyle behaviors after drinking ayahuasca, most of the people reported that they would take more care of physical health, that they would improve their habit, like their, uh, their eating habits, the diet, they would uh, eat less meat. I think that's also well known that many people become vegetarian or even vegan after taking ayahuasca. Um, half of the people reported uh, drinking less alcohol. Um, some reported doing more physical exercise. Um, many people sp spend more time in nature and they engage more in spiritual practices and they feel or act more creative in an intellectual, physical or artistic way. And 60% uh, feel more comfortable with their sexuality. Um, some particular life changes are that 50% of the people uh, reported that they uh, were able to heal long-standing personal uh, rifts. Their, the increased involvement with environmental, environmental and social issues. Um, yeah, things like that. <clears throat> we were also, as I told you, um, interested in uh, pre-existing conditions regarding physical and mental health. Um, we have here on that graph, can you read it at the back? Okay, so on top there's depression. And 31% of the people said that it completely improved. And 50% uh, said that it was much improved, the depression. And only 13% said that it uh, improved a bit. And 5% that it was about the same. 1.5% that it worsened a bit. And only 0.7% reported that it uh, re um, worsened much. Um, Regarding drug problems, it's even more extreme that 65% reported that they uh, completely re uh, resolved their drug problems and 20% much improved. Um, with bipolar, it's not so extreme. So 20% of the people uh, reported that uh, they improved completely or resolved the bipolar uh, issue and about half of the people said that it improved much, and then uh, around 14% uh, a bit improved or about the same. And cancer, um, like 35% reported that it um, resolved completely, so they did not have cancer anymore, and 20% said that they improved much. So, most of the condition or people reported uh, beneficial effects for most of their pre-existing conditions. Um, 
maybe you know that experiment when they um, gave um, gave uh, psilocybin, the Griffiths experiment, when they gave psilocybin to people living in a monastery, and most of the people said that it was the most significant uh, experience in their life. I think that's also related to it, the enhanced meaning and suggestibility, but still it works. And we also see it here in the ayahuasca community that, um, yeah, it, it depends uh, on the uh, localization of the people I, I, geographically, but quite a lot of people say that it was the single most experience of their life. And even more say that it was among the five most ex um, spiritual, significantly uh, experiences of their life. And only a few said that it was not at all spiritual significant. So there's a spiritual significance um, in that uh, experience of the ayahuasca drinking for most of the people all over the world. And as we saw um, regarding the motivation as well, that recreational use or abuse that does not really exist or not so much re um, exist, only a few said just to get high. So the motivation to take ayahuasca is different to other drugs, uh, which is not surprising, but it's nice to have it in the data. Um, the motivations are very similar across contexts, so no matter if people take it in a church or in a shamanic setting, the underlying aspiration or motivation um, is comparable. And people report many be beneficial effects uh, across the whole life uh, regarding well-being, lifestyle, uh, relationships, spirituality. So we really have data to uh, discuss this shift from a biomedical towards a contextual um, paradigm. And it's really necessary because if we can't explain data within a given paradigm, we need to rethink the paradigm. Um, as I mentioned several times, uh, we have a, uh, maybe a selection bias, so people um, who engage in such a questionnaire, they, on one hand, they have to somehow know about that questionnaire. They have to, like, it was not a short questionnaire. It takes, like, maybe some of you also participated. It takes, like, an hour to do that. So people need to be motivated. And usually we have people that are either very convinced that it's very good or that are very convinced that it's very negative, who take so much effort. Um, and some people like who take it once and forget about it, how, how would they know about that survey? So this is a big limitation, but within those people that um, took part, we have the, these data. Um, many of the questions we asked were referring to the lost experience because we can't ask about every experience. You say uh, you saw that many people or some people had uh, experiences with over 2,000 times of drinking ayahuasca. If we would ask about every experience, then it would never end. So we decided to have general questions, but some relating to the lost experience. And uh, an online questionnaire is always a very subjective perspective. Um, so this is a a big limitation that we can't control for many factors. We don't know like who would take place and some would uh, start a survey but then skip and we don't know who would stop it and who would bring it to the end. And I think it's also what I said with the enhanced meaning and suggestibility. We can't control if someone says, okay, I'm much more nature related now, but I fly to the Amazon three times a year. So this is a contradiction, so we can't control for that. Um, but still, it's a nice overview, and I'm happy to receive your questions. And yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, two questions. One, why did you separate Brazil from Latin America? Uh, that's a good question. This was already said by Daniel. I think because Brazil is um, more specific because in terms of that the churches are there. So this like differentiates it from other South American countries. 
which could also be like I think it was uh, okay. That's something else. Your next question. Yeah. Oh, all right. Because we have the Shamahi yeah. and everything, so minimal that what? Yeah, but uh, different to others, the the churches are very present in Brazil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just one more question. I I saw the cancer mm -hmm. uh, high in the slide of how the effect. Yeah, sorry, my English is not very good. Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, what do you, the cancer, I never listen to any study about that in ayahuasca. Do you have any thing to say about that? Why you make this question? Um, that's because of uh, like case reports that people say they, like they could heal also physical um, illnesses like cancer. So we included that in the data, uh, in, the, in the questionnaires. Not only cancer, but I think that's an interesting topic. Um, people say that uh, cancer is also related to stress and like a, like a, the whole, I think it can be cynical because people suffer from cancer and they, they like do their best and they still die. So it would be cynical to say it's only mental and you only have to relax about that. Uh, but it seems to be related to your lifestyle, to your attitude. So if they stop smoking, if they uh, start a healthy diet, if they quit, uh, working too much. Like maybe. Damage, damage, yeah. damage reduction, something like that. Yeah. Maybe. From the damage, damage reduction? Yeah, probably, probably like probably healthier probably. lifestyle? Yeah, huh. and then, oh, okay. I don't know, that's just an assumption because you raised the question and I just associating right, right. what I think. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Could, could you come here because we're recording? So. Oh. I was wondering um, if there was some um, data about um, um, shit taking with other sort of drugs and alcohol, but have you done any research um, on the effects taken with Cambo and Rufo together? Um, I would have to check that with the data we have now. Um, that's interesting um, because it's done, right? Um, so I don't. I only have that data here at the moment. Oh, okay. Because, um, like, um, someone, I took it like a year ago, and someone suggested, I had a really, really unusual experience with that issue, and someone suggested that it might be because I've taken it with, together with UFO, and so yeah. that's quite a common thing. Yeah, that can be dangerous. Taking uh, like with bufotenine or bufo alvarius, with what? Okay. So yeah, this can be a dangerous uh, combination because of the um, like transmitter systems. Uh, so usually you would um, not suggest to take ayahuasca and five neo DMT together. I mean, as not, far not, as I don't not together as in exactly the same time, but the same retreat. Yeah, well, because when you take ayahuasca, some of the ingredients uh, stay in your body, and then it can be can be dangerous. I'm not too much into that, but it can be dangerous it's when. So common to yeah. take beef and cannabis. Yeah, and still, I mean, there are many um, things people do which are maybe not so healthy or risky. <laughs> But I, I think maybe there are better experts on that combination than I am, but I know that this can be a dangerous combination and also like a day after or two days after uh, because of the transmitter systems and how the uh, substance remains in the body. Do you want to say it here so that they can record it? That would be maybe valuable. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, this is only for the 5 mu uh, and the DMT, what I told you. It might be different for combo. Yeah. I've got another question. Oh, OK. Yeah. So um, when I did Irish chat, I didn't purge at all. Did, is that how 
have any indications on the effects? You didn't push, you no. said. Okay. Well, it depends also of the, on the combination of uh, which kind in, and which amount of plants. And like, for example, there are also um, ayahuasca analogs um, not containing harmaline, but only harmaline, and then you purge less or not at all. And there are also mixtures with uh, different amounts of uh, DMT containing uh, plants or harmine, harmaline containing plants. And depending on how it's mixed, and also depending on your condition and how much you ate, how much you drank, how you feel, this can be very different, like if you have to purge or not. There are people saying if you don't purge, it wasn't ayahuasca, I wouldn't agree because there are many mixtures and they are, yeah. It, it's also depending on harmine, harmaline uh, variation. Intention as well, psychological, uh, that's what, what I said, like your uh, personal condition uh, and you could also say if you're holding back or whatever. So many things involved. I think you can explain it from different perspectives, biomedical or also uh, psychological or however. But don't worry, I think if you don't purge, then you don't purge. I'm not worried. Thank you. No, there, there are other substances when you don't purge, it can be dangerous, but with ayahuasca, I wouldn't say so. Huh? Okay, you go, you go on. Oh, okay, thanks for listening. Thank you.